I'm a disaster as a bicycle mechanic. I have broken everything I've ever attempted to fix. I've stripped out just about every screw that you can strip out on a bike. Some of the YouTubes that I've watched to help me do some basic repairs have actually ended up costing me hundreds of dollars for the damage I've done, let alone the parts that I've had to buy over and over again. I've had to just come to grips with the fact that, and it's just been this week that this revelation has hit me. I just feel like sharing my heart with you. I've just discovered that I'm not good at this. And while I can put air in the tires and while I can do some minor little adjustments, you probably don't want me working on your bicycle. I'm pretty lousy at it. This week I had problems with, uh, with one of my bikes, my, this ailing piece of equipment. And so I, I took it to my friends over at Greensboro Trek, walked in the door with it after, after frustrations upon frustrations upon frustrations. I walked through the door and here was my approach. I screwed this up. I don't know how to fix it. <laughs> fix it. And so they, they put it up on, on the stand. They had a moment and stamps went to work. And after about five minutes, he said, well, it's this, this, and this. He diagnosed three things just like that. And the, thing, the reason that, that encouraged me was because when he said that, I knew also that he knew exactly how to, how to fix it. And at the core, it all came down to a problem with alignment. Say alignment. alignment. Think about that word, alignment. If we're walking in alignment, we are in line together, one following the other in perfect order. Alignment. Think about that concept because we're going to be talking about that all morning. Alignment falls at the very center of the blessed life. How to live a blessed life. We want to talk about it today. How to live a blessed life. I haven't preached a whole lot on blessing. I've realized, a few weeks ago I realized, I just haven't talked a lot about the blessing of God. So today it's going to be all about blessing. Well, back to the bike store. Problem is my gears and the chain were not perfectly aligned. And so there was a lot of rubbing and there was grinding and the shifts didn't hit at the right time and the chain was falling off and you name it. It was a mess and it all came down to alignment. Maybe you've experienced problems with alignment. If you drove to church this morning and at the front of your car you felt a wobble, 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 wobble or you heard that boom, 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 as you were driving down the street, chances are you've got a wheel out of line. I got news for you. It's not going to get any better on its own. How many of you live that life of faith with your car? Something goes wrong and you just pray. Lord, let that warning light go out. I've heard of people of great faith. I've never heard anyone yet say, I prayed all those warning lights away. I haven't had this car in for service for 10 years. No, I, I've got news for you. It is not going to, it's not good. That alignment issue is not going to get better. It's going to get worse. And because of that lack of alignment, there will now come some compounding problems on top of it to where you won't just have a problem with the tires. You'll start having a problem with a number of other things. And before long, you're going to need a whole new front end. And, and by the way, I'm not talking right now so much about your cars. I'm talking about your life. Because some of you aren't living with good vibrations. You got bad vibrations. You got a bad vibe going on in your life. Why is that bad vibe there? It's because something's out of alignment. You know what it is when you just feel all of a sudden something's not right. Something's not clicking. I just don't know exactly what it is. Can't put my finger on it. But I, there's a vibe. Well, that's a vibration. There's, there's something that's out of line. And the Holy Spirit works on us at times and stirs us at times to recognize there's something out of line. It's God's warning system. You got something out of alignment. It's time to get this fixed. That vibration will lead to wear, uneven wear. You, you will always, when you're out of alignment, you will always lose your sense of balance. I wish I could just stay and preach a whole message on that. And that's my frustration this morning is that I'm, I'd like to just kind of camp out here. 
Well, after vibration and wear, you've also got the issue of noise. Because that noise is only going to get worse. And have you found that life gets really, really noisy at times? When your life gets out of alignment, you'll begin to lose that sense of peace. Because all around you, you've got a cacophony of noise that just seems to be building and building and building. And oh, by the way, you also get heat. Why do you get heat when, you're out, when things are out of alignment? Because you have friction that's not supposed to be there. And that friction does what? It just generates heat. And heat starts grinding on the parts. And the parts begin to fail. And one causes the other to fail. And the alignment becomes worse. And before long, you're that guy sitting at the intersection with the vehicle and the front nose is down like this. And the wheel's sitting off on the... You know the guy I'm talking about? Have you been there? Is that you? Have you seen that guy? He's... I mean, the thing's laying down on the ground and the wheel's over here. And I always want to just stop and say, how come you didn't check that? Surely there was a warning somewhere before the wheel came off your car. This is the problem with alignment. If you don't fix it before long, the wheels come off. You have what we call catastrophic failure. And I can tell you, as one who works with people on an ongoing basis, when I deal with someone, when I deal with someone who has had a catastrophic life failure, we can trace it back and you will find every one of the issues that we've been talking about that come to a place in their lives where alignment somehow was put out of order. And when alignment is gone, when our lives do not align, we begin to fail. We can talk about your tires. We can talk about your bones. I had a chiropractor come up to me right after the first service this morning. He was so excited. He said, that sermon was like, that's what I do. I said, I know. That's what I do. I mean, that's what I do. I, I know. If you've been to the chiropractor, what's the chiropractor trying to do? Trying to bring everything back into alignment. And that's not always a pleasant experience, but they pop and they grind and they do this and they do that. And with therapy, what are we doing? We're strengthening sets of muscles to bring us in the same idea, to bring our spines into alignment. Because when we're in alignment, we feel good. I've got a friend who sees a chiropractor about every week. And after that visit to the chiropractor, he always does this. Oh man, I feel so good. Why? Because everything has been brought back into alignment. Alignment is a position of agreement and alliance. Agreement and alliance. How's your alliance? How's your alignment with God? If your life is out of alignment... All of the maladies that I've talked about, spiritual and even manifesting in the physical realm, all of those will be yours. Living a blessed life is all about alignment. So in answer to the question, how to live, how can I live a blessed life? In a word, alignment. If you will remember that word, as we fill in some of the blanks here this morning, if you will re remember that word, you will have a chart before you, a place where you can start when you feel that life is starting to get out of control, where you can bring things in to a place where God's blessings are flowing once again. It's all about alignment. It's bringing your heart, your head, your feet, your hands, your plans into alignment with God's heart, God's word, God's purposes, and God's season or God's timing. Alignment. Last week I spoke from Malachi about people who were out of alignment. They were out of alignment in their giving, or I should say in their paying. They weren't paying their tithes. And so everything in their lives were out of alignment. And the prophet rises up to say, you got a real problem. I'm going to lay it out for you. you got a problem here. You're, you're robbing God, and so you're cursed rather than blessed. What was the problem? Alignment. You weren't doing what you were supposed to be doing, and you weren't bringing what you were supposed to be bringing. And because you weren't walking in obedience... Your life got out of alignment, and now Malachi said to the people, you're living as a cursed people rather than a blessed people. They struggled with paying the tithes in Malachi. 
You know the passage. Will a man rob God? Yet you've robbed me of the tithe. They, they struggle. And that's what we say. We say, I'm having a struggle paying my tithes. The language we use to go easy on ourselves. If the word of God tells you to do this and you don't do it, that is disobedience. And at the core, that is, that's not a struggle. That's rebellion. That's rebellion. I have people come in all the time and, and tell me about their struggles. Well, I'm struggling with this. I'm struggling with that. And in moments of boldness, at times, I have said, when you say struggle, what you're really talking about is an unwillingness to do what the word of God says. Is that right? Yeah, well, yeah, that's my struggle. That's not a struggle. That's rebellion. You've already won the struggle. You're winning. God is not. You've already given yourself the victory. You're doing it your way, and your way is not working. It's not a struggle. It's rebellion. Some of you are looking at me like I'm really offline here. I'm just telling you the truth. We take it easy at times. It's just, I'm having a little struggle here. I'm having a little struggle. I'm having a little struggle with rebellion against God's word. That's not a struggle. Well, the children of Israel, they weren't struggling. They just weren't doing it. And when they did bring the tithes, they were bringing not the best and the first. They were bringing the last and the wounded and the, the bleeding and the dying. And they were bringing God the junk left over in their lives rather than bringing what he expected of them. And so I'm not going to re-preach the message from last Sunday because I told you today we're going to talk about blessing, not cursing. But God uses possessions and money to test our faith and also our hearts. All that we have, all that we possess, all that we hold in our hands, we have because of him. We settled that issue last week. It's all his. And so the question that arises in life is a question of stewardship. He asks us not to touch his tithe and to be faithful in the offerings as he speaks to our heart to give to this, to give to that. But the tithe is his. There was so much more last week I wanted to just unpack. And so I added, this is not really a sermon so much as an addendum of sorts this morning from Malachi. And so apologies at the very front end. You, I, this is not a great sermon. You so say, I came for a great sermon this morning. Sorry, you chose, don't come on holiday weekends. It's not that, but here was the core text for our purposes I'm going to highlight a few key words, okay? Last week, here was our core text. Will a man rob God, yet you're robbing me? But you say, how have we robbed you? In your tithes and contributions. You are cursed. That's a strong word, isn't it? You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there will be food in my house. Thereby, put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing. What a wonderful word. A blessing until there is no more need. That's some kind of blessing. A blessing until there is no more need. I will rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not destroy the fruits of your soil and your vine in the field will not fail to bear, says the Lord of hosts. Then all of the nations will call you Blessed, for you'll be a land of delight. Another term, the idea of blessing, of delight, says the Lord of hosts. Blessed. What a common term in Christian circles. Blessed. Blessed comes through in a lot of our language and a lot of our songs, and we talk about blessings, we sing about blessings. I don't know that we stop and consider as we should, as much as we should, what it means to be blessed. Definition, well, blessed is a favor or gift bestowed by God, therefore bringing happiness and protection or security. To be blessed is Literally, to be overshadowed by God with his goodness, his mercy, his gifts, his kindness, his favor, blessed. And God has given us an instruction book for the blessed life. The scriptures from Genesis to Revelation, the scriptures unpack for us the path that we follow to enter into a life of blessing. The Bible's a book of blessings with vivid, vivid lessons on 
and illustrations on how that blessing can be gained and also how that blessing can be lost. The theme of God's blessing can be traced through every phase of the scriptures. We see in the law of God, when God gives Moses the law and he lays it all out, well, we could even start in the garden, but in the garden and then in the law, he lays it all out. And then with the prophets, this is what you do. And if you do, you'll be blessed. So the garden, the law, the prophets, the Psalms are full of blessing. They not only instruct us, they lead us in thanksgiving for the blessings of God. They're all about blessings. Of course, you move, turn to the New Testament and you have the Sermon on the Mount, you have the counsel from Paul's epistles and Peter's epistles and John's writings. You have revelation of things to come that talk about the blessings yet to come. And I mean, the Bible is a book of blessings. We are instructed from Genesis to Revelation in living the blessed life. That said, look at the hard word from Malachi last week. You're robbing God, he said to them. And this has brought you under a curse. Now, this is the part you need to hear. But return to me. And return to me is talking about the heart. Return to me, because the heart will affect the actions and the activity. Return to me, says the Lord. Bring your practice into alignment with my law and watch. I will bless you. You've been rebellious You've been disobedient. You've been walking this way. Everything is out of alignment in your life. You have the pain that comes with it. You got the friction. You got the heat. You got the trouble. You got the breakdown. You've got the wear and tear. You got everything that comes with misalignment. But return to me. And because I am a God of grace, return to me. Return to me. And I will bless you. Bring your life back into alignment with my word and I will bless you. In this week of preparation, I have thought of little else but this concept of blessing. And should I, I became convinced once I began in Genesis and started working my, should I choose to, should I choose to just preach about the subject of blessing? I know that I could preach about the blessings of God until my last breath. Not my last breath this morning, my last breath. Because the Bible is absolutely full of this. If I were to write, if I were to present a biblical history of blessing, I would be preaching on the theme forever. People, you see, people often see God in light of his impending judgment. Most of us do. Anyone out there, you see God more as a God of judgment than, I know you're not going to raise your hand, but if, I just want to talk to you. If, you. if you see him as a God of judgment rather than blessing, it's probably because of partly the way that you were raised and the way that you've experienced God. And also a struggle in your life to really receive the grace of God. But you see, you see the Christian life as trying to keep all the rules. And because you struggle to keep all the well, struggle, there's that word. Because you break the rules. Because you break the rules, you feel like God is always just about to put down his heavy thumb on you. Right? And so you live with the concept of God who's kind of like a, a grumpy judge. And he, he'll give us what we want. Eventually, he'll, he'll do it. But he's kind of mad. What's your image of God? For somebody here today, that's your image. You have this, you have this idea of God. God is, he is indeed the judge. He's the judge of all the earth. Indeed, he is the judge. You're not wrong in that. But if you see him only in that light, you will, you will begin to act as though God's mad at you all the time. And you may have a mother-in-law who convinces you of that. Or a father-in-law. It doesn't have to be. I'm sorry. I'll get letters. We have this idea, you know, that, that, that God is you know, grudgingly giving us things. It's kind of like, tra you know, training a dog. I'm not a dog person. We're not animal people. But those of you who are, I'm amazed at the way you love your animals. It's, a, it's, it's an amazing thing. You know, I've, I've watched what you do. 
You get that little treat, and what do you do? You train the dog to do what? Obey? Well, not so much obey. Do the trick. You know, the dog doesn't sit there and say, should I rebel today? Do I really feel like doing this? How do I really feel about my man? No, no, no. The dog, it's all about, I do this, I do the trick, I eat. Okay. So, I mean, it's a very simple thing. But what do you do? This is the way that, that we look at God. It's as though God has the treat and he's going, I want you to roll over. No, that's not right. I roll over. No, that's not right. Here we are just sitting there going... <laughs> I want you to roll, I want you to roll over, I want you to roll over. And finally, it's like, okay. So you roll, you do the trick, and so what does God do? Throws you a doggy treat. You say, well, that's a silly illustration. That's exactly how people see God. You do what I want, and I'll throw you a treat every once in a while. Rather than God saying, I love you so much. I want to open up the windows of heaven and I want to pour out a blessing that is so rich you'll have no more need. See, when we view God only through the lens of judgment, we get a false concept, a false, a, a, a false picture of who he is. He's a God of blessing. God is looking for people to bless. Walk through, walk through the Bible. Let me just touch on a few things. In Genesis, the first chapter, verses 27 and 28, we're only 27 verses into Genesis. Human life is introduced into God's unfolding creation here. So God, God creates man and woman. Here's what it says. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. Isn't that something? It's almost like God finishes, he looks there, he goes, look at that, look at that couple. They're wonderful. I'm just gonna bless them. It doesn't say that Adam had said a thing yet or that Eve had an opinion to offer. She didn't even know where the apple tree was. They're just standing there, newly created, standing for God. And God says, I am so pleased with what I have done. I am, my posture towards you is going to be what? Blessing. And God blessed them. Now walk a little further with me. After the flood, you know the people became increasingly evil and God destroys the earth with a flood. He preserves humanity through Noah and through his offspring. But after Noah... The people return to their evil ways. The subsequent reemergence of evil in the earth is, is absolutely horrific. And so God calls a man by the name of Abram with a new effort in reaching his lost creation. With Abraham, it was almost like a do-over. God said, okay, Abraham, I'm going to, I'm going to speak to you. I'm going to deal with you. I'm going to work through you. And I'm going to bring redemption to the world. I'm going to bring redemption to the world through you and through your seed. And in Genesis 12, we read, God says to Abraham, go from your country and your kindred to your father's house, to the land and your father's house, to the land I will show you, and I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you. I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. God's a God of blessing. It's God's first inclination to bless, to shower down his favor upon us. And what then if that theme, blessing, is traced through Abraham's son Isaac to his son Jacob and then to the 12 tribes of Israel? There alone we would be here all morning, we'd be here all week. And then what if we turn our attention from there to the promise of blessing in the judges and then in the prophets, my goodness, Isaiah alone. Can you imagine spending time in the prophets just tracking what the prophets have to say about the blessing of God? And then we turn to the Psalms, and, and in the Psalms, the very first word in Psalms is blessed. Now, the most popular Psalm, they tell me, is the 23rd. 
The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. We know that one well, but the second has got to be the first one. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly or stands in the way of sinners or sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in that law he meditates day and night. He will be like a tree planted by rivers of water, bringing forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth, the King James says, whatsoever he doeth will what? prosper. Blessed is this man. Who is this man? He's a man who lives in alignment. Blessed is this man. When Jesus enters the world, he is God's ultimate blessing. The most famous sermon that he preaches, and by the way, the Sermon on the Mount is commonly held by men to be among the greatest words in human discourse ever spoken. How does he begin the Sermon on the Mount? Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. There's a catalog. Blessed, 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 blessed. The sermon completely presupposes the reality of the blessed life. You see, the God that we discover in the Scripture is obsessing on blessing. I thought a lot about that before I said it, not because I think it's clever. I said it because it's, it's, it's almost like superlative language. Is God really obsessed with blessing? It's the best way for me to describe what I find when I examine the scripture from Genesis to Revelation. He stubbornly wants to bless his people. I could use an amen this morning. I'm feeling very lonely. Just lonely, really lonely. He's determined to bless. He is yearning to bless. We talk about his goodness. We sing about his goodness. We sang it this morning. God is good. What's that talking about? What are these songs talking? They're talking about God's blessings to us. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. We're talking about he blesses his children. And that goodness, the goodness of God is displayed in his desire, in his longing, and in his activity in blessing his creation. He is looking to bless. Second Chronicles 16, 9. Second Chronicles 16, 9. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to give strong support to those whose heart is blameless towards him. He's looking for someone. If I'm looking for someone, say I came down here this morning and I said, I am looking for a non-tither. If you're looking down, you just told me. I'm looking for, let's see, are you on this side? I'm looking for, I could walk all over this looking. Does it make you uncomfortable when I come back here? What if I just sat down next to you? Now, you it's, when I'm looking for, I'm kind of targeting, isn't it? You see, the scripture wants us to understand that the eyes of the Lord run to and fro in the earth, and he's looking for someone to bless. And who is that? The man or the woman who's living in alignment with his word and his will. He's looked, this is the nature of God. This is the way that he is working. He runs to and fro in the earth. Granted, it's a very poetic flourish that the, the uh, writer employs here, but see it for what it is. He does not grudgingly bless or reluctantly reward. He wants to bless you. Now, what are we going to do with that biblical truth? It should beg the question, okay, how can I live the blessed life? That's where we go back to the start of this addendum. And that one word, alignment. If you'll understand this principle, you'll be able to do some self-diagnosis in what's going on in your life. Alignment. Everything that's happening in your life, when it aligns with God's purposes and his will, it will begin to function as it should. And when it is not, it can really be a mess. The secret of the blessed life is alignment. The first point of alignment, let me give you three uh, quickly. The first point of alignment is, is the heart. Is your heart like the heart of God? Is your heart aligned with his heart? The heart is your, the seat of your emotions, your desire, your will. That's your heart. 
Is your will, your heart, your desire, your emotion, are you after what he's after? Or is there a misalignment? I've never been able to understand churches that don't give to world missions. There are somewhere around 20% of our churches in our movement that don't give a dollar to world missions. Even though we as a movement were started as a missions movement. I, I don't understand that. I cannot fathom. I can't fathom that. For me, that is a massive misalignment with the heart of God. What does he tell us? What's the last? What was his last great command? And it should be our great concern. What was it? Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And when a church has no concept of all the world and it's all about us here in our little village, if, if we don't have that concept, if it's not driving us all the world, there is a misalignment with the heart of God that keeps churches terribly small. Terribly small. Can't expect a church to grow when it has no, mission, no sense of God. What's the heart of God? The heart of God is souls. Not only here, but especially abroad. All the world, he says, don't limit yourself. Go into all of the world and preach the gospel. Wherever souls are not being reached, wherever they're not a priority, you have a misalignment of hearts. The heart of the church is not aligned with the heart of God. What about your heart? Is your heart, your desires, your will, is it aligned with God's heart? See, Chronicles is a sketchbook of kings and kingdoms and Israel, and, and we're not given exhaustive histories, just these little glimpses, these little sketches of the kings. That verse that we read a moment ago in 2 Chronicles 16 that addressed Asa, the king of Judah, now let's look at the whole verse, okay? For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout all the earth to give strong support to those whose heart is blameless towards them. And here God is speaking to Asa through the prophet, through the, through the, um, the chronicler. He says, you have done foolishly in this, for from now on you're going to have war. Well, there's a backstory here. There's a backstory to this verse. For the majority of his long reign... A king named Asa, he had 35 years without war and conflict, unheard of in that entire region. When you go to the Middle Eastern, unheard of. 35 years. You know what that means? 35 years of growth and prosperity, 35 years of stability, 35 years of blessing. For 35 years, there's no war whatsoever. Well, how did it all come apart? For the first 35 years, the Bible tells us that Asa did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. You know what we call that? Alignment. Asa's service as a king came into alignment with God's will and the blessings of God were seen in the nation. He tore down idols and false altar, altars to false gods. He repaired and completely supplied the altar of God in Jerusalem. He revived the priesthood and made sure that the tithes and that the offerings and the sacrifices were all flowing so that there was a legitimate form of Old Testament worship that was taking place before God. He made no allowance for idolatry. He even removed his own mother from her office as queen mother because she had kept a little God on her own, so he had that God, the Asherah pole, he had it hacked down and he had it burned. And when you're taking on mama, you know you're serious. You're serious. How many of you, how many of you grown men today still, you wouldn't cross your mother, come on. Asa, he had determined in his heart that he would serve the Lord and for those first years of his, of his reign, it was blessing, it was a prosperous era. He found that alignment and the blessing of God flowed. But the end of his reign was nothing like the beginning. The golden years dried up like that. Somewhere, somehow, and we're not given all of the inside story, Asa ceased to trust the Lord. And we see it evidenced when he saw the rumblings in the kingdom to the north of him. When he saw rumblings of war, rather than trust the Lord as he had for 35 years, rather than trust the Lord he took things into his own hand and decided that he could scheme his way to safety and security. And because he didn't trust the Lord, he came out of alignment. Now here's the way it worked. Asa, I'll put his kingdom right here. 
He's in Judah in the south. Asa looks to the north where the 10 tribes who are now totally pagan at this point in history, the 10 tribes, the northern 10 tribes of Israel who are not serving God at all under a king named Basha, they start looking at Judah and they're preparing for war. Basha on that, on his southern border, which is Asa's northern border, right on that border, he begins to build massive fortifications. Asa's not stupid. He looks to the north and he sees Basha building all of these fortifications where there were none and stationing of soldiers and he knows, aha, we're going to war. He's coming after me. Now in that moment, let's, if if, in that moment, if you play this thing right, in that moment, Asa goes to the temple and he stands before the priests. He says, we need to pray because we have an adversary. I humble myself before he, he gets on his knees. He gets on his face before God. He calls the nation to pray. You ever hear that scripture? If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Remember that from Isaiah? The equations never changed. They were supposed to trust the Lord and pray for his deliverance. And Asa doesn't do any of that. He doesn't consult the prophet. He doesn't consult Hananiah. He doesn't consult any of them. He unpacks his own scheme. He forges an alliance with Ben-Hadad. Now here's the way that works. You've got Judah, and then you've got the 10 tribes of Israel up here that are coming against them. And north of them, as you do today, you have Syria. And Syria was ruled by a bad guy named Ben-Hadad, or Ben-Hadad, some call him. Ben-Hadad, up here in the north, he's trouble for everybody. But Asa thinks, you know, I think I can manipulate the circumstance here to my advantage. So what does he do? He sends a message up to Ben-Hadad. He said, I'd like you to work with me here. You got problems with Basha? I got problems with Basha. My problems are your problems. Here's what we need to do. Why don't you, why don't you attack Basha from the north, mess with him, take some of his cities, cause him some problems, and I'll take care of the other end of the equation, but I need you to attack first. Well, Ben-Hadad could have easily have said, why don't you attack him from the south, and then I'll come and... So how does he sweeten the deal? Well, Asa goes into the temple treasury, and he takes God's money. And what does he do with it? He sends the silver and gold from the temple treasury, not the government, from the temple treasury. He sends it to Ben-Hadad. He sends him God's money and he says, here's a bunch of money. I'm paying you off. You become my mercenary army. You tie him up from the north. Well, it worked. Ben-Hadad brings his army down. He begins to invade those border towns on the northern border of, of the ten tribes of Israel. As he, as he comes in, and he's causing all kinds of problems. Basha looks around. He says, wow, I got problems on my northern border. So what do you do? You call up all your troops from the southern border, and you send them to the northern border to fight. And so all of the troops go away from the northern border or from the southern border, going up north to fight. Asa goes in with his soldiers, and they completely dismantle all of the fortifications that Basha had built, take them south a little bit and rebuild them as their own fortifications against Basha. Pretty slick plan. I pay you, you tie them up, I rob them blind. At the end of the game, I've got fortifications. He doesn't. I'm in a strengthened position. He's in a weakened position. You say, well, that sounds like that's pretty shrewd. Yeah, We can all do things that are pretty clever and pretty shrewd, but they might not be God's will. Sometimes we do, sometimes we do things and, and we think we're really, we've really been very clever and we've really been very smart. But bottom line is we did it because we weren't trusting God. We didn't seek him. We didn't search for his plan or find his way. (laughs) The plan worked perfectly. But it was the end of Asa. You see, Proverbs admonishes the reader, trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. Asa failed to put his trust in God and in following his own schemes, his path became crooked. His life became out of alignment. It's a sad story of misalignment. And God's judgment fell 
rather than his blessing. I want to just talk to three points here that you can apply and then we'll be done. Above all, the scripture says guard your heart. So the first point we've already spoken of, the first point is the alignment of your heart. Is your heart aligned with the will of God? This is the question of surrender as a lover. You see, we don't surrender ourselves to God as a matter of practicality. Well, he's God and I'm not, so... Hmm. There's a, submit, there's a surrender and a submission that comes. We'll talk about that in a moment. But first of all, what's the greatest commandment? Thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, your strength. Jesus said it's the greatest commandment. The basis of relationship that God wants with us is one that is based not just on rule keeping. He wants a relationship with us based on love. I trust my wife with everything that I have, everything that she knows about me, everything that we possess. I trust her absolutely. I trust her absolutely because I love her. And I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that, and this is the shocker, I know you might not love me. You might not love me if I don't let you out until three, 2 o'clock. But you may not love me, but I know that, well, she'll be upset with me too. But she'll love me. She will still love me. The security that we have is based on love. We love one another. We delight in one another. We're having a lot of fun in this stage and phase. It's a great season in our lives and in our marriage. It gets better once you get those kids out. It really does. We're having a great season in our lives. We have a love relationship and, and trust is based on on love, and our relationship with the Lord must first be a heart relationship, a love. This is the surrender. God calls us to the surrender of a lover. That's what God was looking for. That's what God is looking for. Love me. And so you want to bring your life into alignment with God. Your heart has to come into play. You can't just do this by obedience or keeping the rules. How many of you have found out that people who just keep all of the rules are generally pretty miserable people? They are no fun to hang out with. I'm not saying I want us to be rebellious or break all. I just tell people who are just punctilious about, I'm not going to break. I'm just, they're so, they are just so caught up in keeping the rule keepers. May my heart have no fellowship with them. They wear me out. I'm waiting for them to judge me on anything, everything that I do, because unless I am just as concerned about keeping every jot and tittle like they are, then they condemn you. We're not called into that kind of relationship with God. It's a love relationship. It's a love relationship. It's trust based on love. He gives strong support to those whose heart is blameless before him. I trust her. I know she loves me. My relationship with God has to be the same way. We get in trouble when we forget that God loves us and longs to bless us. So we try and bend life to our will like Asa did. We get clever. And when our heart slips out of alignment and troubles multiply, we've got a lot of people out there who say, just follow your heart. Just follow. Don't follow your heart. The Bible says it's deceitful above all things. Who can know it? Follow your heart. Follow your heart. That's the stupidest advice anybody could ever give. You follow your heart, you'll do the dumbest things you've ever done. I said, almost said in the first service, I was almost in trouble with it, but it's kind of the idea, you know, I, I probably would have been in a lot of trouble with infidelity, even in my relationship with my wife, if I just followed my heart. I'm not going any further than that because she's staring holes through me right now. I feel the heat. We had a moment of misalignment there. Follow your heart. Your heart is your desire and your emotions. And has anyone else found that your desire and your emotions are kind of all over the gauge? They just, the gauge goes all over the map. The compass just kind of spins. You get a little lost sometimes. Follow your heart. Who's that woman who sells the jewelry? Just follow your heart. And she's got, she's got heart. I think it's Jane Seymour. Don't follow Jane Seymour. Follow Jesus. Jane just wants to sell you jewelry. Jesus wants to bless you. You don't follow your heart. You follow the Lord. You bring your heart into alignment with his heart. 
So our surrender to God is the surrender of a lover. Talk secondly about the alignment of your will. This is the surrender not of a lover so much. This is surrender to lordship. Surrender to lordship. Because he is Lord. You know, say, I'm going to make Jesus Lord of my life. Well, I understand what you're saying in that. But in reality, you don't make him or break him. He is Lord. He is Lord. One day, every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess it. The bottom line is he is Lord. So as a follower of Jesus Christ, I don't want my will to be out of alignment with his will. I surrender to his will and bring my life into alignment so that blessing can flow. I surrender to his lordship. And when lordship rules in life, stewardship is a natural outflow. If Jesus is the Lord of my life, he's the Lord of my wallet, he's the Lord of my checkbook, he's the Lord of, of my investment, he's the Lord of everything that I, he's the Lord of my life. And so I bring my will into alignment with his, that's surrender, that's surrender to his lordship. Jesus in the garden says, Father, if it be your will, let this cup pass from me. Have you ever wondered at that? This is Jesus in the full human flesh. This is the demonstration of God's reality in coming to earth and becoming a man. He looks at the horror that's coming and he looks to the Father and he says, if it be your will, let this pass from me. But nevertheless, not my will, but thine alignment. Bringing our will into alignment. Finally, we need to talk about our way. Our way. Oh, well, just so we don't miss this. Bringing our will into the, you say, how can I find in the will of God? That's a question that most teenagers have and a lot of adults. How can I really find God's will for my life? Let me give you a couple threads to pull on. This is the way I found it. It works. Generally, we start pulling on a particular thread and it will lead us to the next one and the next, and we find the will of God as we begin to pull on some of these threads. Here's, here's the first one. I'll give you two. Here's the first one. It's the Word of God. Somewhere in the Word of God, what you're dealing with intersects the Word. God has spoken to all of the issues of life. Somewhere, somewhere, the Word of God will speak. It will speak. How do I find God's will for my life? You've got to dive into the Word of God. The second part is prayer. You will seek me and you find me when you search for me with all your heart. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. The Bible talks about the importance of prayer. Paul says, don't be anxious for anything. In everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God and the peace of God that passes all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. These are the threads we pull on that bring us into surrender to the Lordship of Jesus. We find his will and we say, okay, my life now needs to line up with his will as revealed through prayer and in the word of God. Finally, it's our ways. We should consider the alignment of our ways. Sometimes the way we're living is a contradiction to the confession we're making. If you find that your life is working against your confession, you got a big problem with alignment. And your ways, your ways need to change. The third proverb we referenced earlier said, in all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. Do your ways, your daily living, include him? In all your ways, acknowledge him. Can he step into your business? Can he step into your marriage? Can he step into anything you've got going on in life and be fully acknowledged? Are you comfortable saying before the people that you work with, Jesus Christ is the Lord of my life and you can check my life against the scriptures? Or are you fudging on that somehow? Have you drawn a, a line? Is there a bifurcation between what the Word of God says and who you are on Monday and Tuesday, what you look like on Sunday and who you are on Thursday and Friday? All of your ways need to come into, what's the word? Alignment. They need to come into alignment with His ways. Is God a mere spectator in your life? Is He a counselor in your life? Is He an advisor in your life? Or is He literally marking the path that you follow? You see, God has given us absolute and complete freedom 
freedom of will and of passage through life. He doesn't will that anyone should perish. But when somebody stands up and says, I'm going to do it my way, God says, okay, do it your way. God does not intervene and say, I'm just going to shake you until you come around. He, he doesn't say, I'm going to, I'm going to manipulate all the circumstances in your life so that you have to, ultimately, you just have to come to me. No, no. He has given us free will, absolute autonomy and freedom. He'll never take that from us. He will have us by love or, or not at all. You realize that, don't you? He will not have us by force. He'll have us by love or not at all. But he has granted to us this wonderful freedom to choose him and to follow him all the days of our lives. We have this autonomy, but it will only lead to blessing as it comes into alignment. The old timer said, surrender your will to his will. That's alignment. We walk in his ways. You can do this today, bring your life into alignment. Say, how do I do it? There's a word, surrender. It's always about surrender. It's about lordship and love and following. Simple little gospel message here. Jesus has called us into a life of blessing it is waiting for us as we bring our lives into alignment with his purpose and his plan. Would you stand with me? God, you're so good. God, you're so good. God, so good, you're so good to come on, sing it. I am blessed, I am blessed, I am called, I am healed, I am whole, I am saved in Jesus' name, highly favored, anointed. Filled with your power for the glory of Jesus' name. Sing it, God, you're so good. God, you're so good. God, you're so good. God, you're so good. God, If you need to surrender your life fully to Jesus Christ, you need to do it today. You need to do it right now. It's not a difficult thing to do, and he'll give you the power to do it, but you have to take that step. If your life is out of alignment and you need someone to pray with you, you need someone to help you. Maybe you know immediately what you need to confess before God, and you don't need a pastor, a priest, an intercessor to stand with you. Then. Make your confession before the Lord and ask him to come in and bring that alignment into, into its place. But if you need someone to pray with you, I'm here and our prayer partners are coming and they'll be standing here at the front. If you need prayer this morning, we want to pray with you for it is only as our lives come into alignment that we can know his blessing. And until that alignment is experienced, we are only fooling ourselves. And I pray, if God's speaking to your heart, I pray that you'll come and you'll pray with us this morning here at the front. I'm going to ask my team to join me. Father, may your hand rest upon us. Use us for your glory and your honor and bring our lives evermore into alignment with your will and your word, that our ways would be pleasing before you and that blessing would flow into us and out through us in Jesus' name. Amen. May God richly bless.